Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Tom, and I'm the interim pastor here at New Era Reformed Church. It's a beautiful morning, and we've come together to worship God. And uh, we want to be sure today that you feel welcomed and blessed as you come here. So why don't you stand? We'll say hi to each other. Friends, God calls us to worship with these words from Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And also you are members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with the Lord Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
I sing for all that you've done for me. Lord, we just think about all that you have done for us. Even though we stand here as sinners, you went to the cross for us. You knew we would come into existence so many years later, and you died for our sins as you have died for the sins of all. And Lord, we just thank you for that sacrifice, even though we are so undeserving. Thank you for being our Lord, and thank you for being our Savior. It is for that we praise your name. In your name we pray, amen. The Bible tells us there's an infinite gap caused by our sin between us and a holy God. And the scripture also says about the Lord Jesus, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so it's beautiful to sing and meditate about all the things that God has done for us with our salvation. So let's go to God in prayer at this time. Almighty God, loving God, we are here today united as brothers and sisters, living in your kingdom as part of your church. We've gathered together, we lift up our eyes to see you and to hear from you and to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we have expectant faith. We believe you are our God and that the kingdom of God can, through Jesus Christ, can conquer all things. Lord, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would transform us. May the light of the gospel be upon us, bring us peace. We pray, Lord, that you will open our ears to your good news, that you will open our eyes to see your truth and open our hearts to receive your endless love. You are worthy of all our praise. Lord, today we ought want to mention some prayer requests and concerns and lift them up before you. Uh, we want to pray, God, for Awas Honduras uh, as the rains have wiped away all of their agricultural um, hopes for this year, and we want to pray that we could bless them with your uh, gifts of uh, corn and rice and beans to plant. And uh, we just lift them up before you, Lord, that you would ease their suffering and provide in their hunger. God, we also want to lift up today the 
teachers and students that are beginning a new school year. We pray that you will encourage the teachers, that you will help them feel a sense of purpose, of building education into the lives of children, young people. We pray for the students, Lord, that you will give them clear minds and, and uh, give them eagerness to learn, uh, to be diligent about their studies. Lord, we also pray for Lynn James this morning, who's recovering from surgery, and we're thankful that it went well, and we pray you will continue to be with her. We pray, God, for members of our congregation who are shut in. We pray for those affected by COVID this morning. We think of the world again, and we pray for Ukraine, and we pray for peace in that nation. Uh, we pray, God, that your love and the Spirit will speak powerfully through your people in that war-torn nation. We lift up before you this morning those that are suffering from mental health concerns, and we ask that you will minister to them through the power of your Spirit and give healing and give, give hope. Last of all, we pray that you'll revive us, God, as a people. Revive us with love for you. Revive us with love for each other. And revive us, God, to participate in your mission of God's kingdom. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our offering at this time. And uh, as I mentioned during the prayer time, uh, next week, Sunday, uh, our, for our love offering, we're going to be taking an offering for Awas Honduras. We have supported a health clinic there over the years. Uh, but as I said in the prayer, they've had an overabundance of rain. It's wiped out corn, rice, and beans. And so our offering is going to be used to purchase um, seed for those products so they can hopefully have a winter harvest. So pray with us about that and uh, encourage you to support it generously next week. Thank you. If Abel, would you stand and join us? This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. With all my heart. That is sometimes really hard. But man, it's important. Let's sing.
nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace help me find a way bring me back to songs are truly what we believe in our hearts, but in this world it is so hard. It is so hard to really have that desire. So many things get in the way. And I just pray that as we listen to the word today that Pastor Tom brings to us, and as we live our lives each day, that you will truly help us to be near to you, to have that desire to continue to grow closer to you every day, Lord. So with these things we thank you. Amen. I'd like you to, if you would, please, you can take your Bibles in hand or you can read on a screen. Uh, Mark chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark 12, 28 through 34. Near the kingdom. Now, one of the scribes had uh, come up and heard their debate, noticing how well Jesus had answered them. He asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, this is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with your mind and with all your strength. The second commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Right, teacher, the scribe replied, you have stated correctly that God is one and there is no other but him. And to love him with all of your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself, which is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that the man had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is God's word. May there be praise in the church because of it. Friends, I have been a Detroit Lion fan since I was 10 years old, for sure. Maybe younger than that. I'm 65 now. Wow, it's been a lot of suffering. <laughs> you know... I hear these young bucks that are 30 or 40 complain about the Lions always being bad. I'm saying to those guys, you have no idea. The date was um, September 22, I think, 1974. It had been five years since the Detroit Lions had defeated the Minnesota Vikings, and the Vikings had a 13-game winning streak over Detroit. Uh, and the problem for me personally is that I cared more uh, then. The Lions, and it seemed like the Lions would lose a game to them every way imaginable. The Vikings had the best defense in the NFL, led by what was called the Purple People Eaters, and I think that was Carl Eller, who went on to become a judge in Minneapolis, uh, Alan Page, Jim Marshall, Marshall, and Gary Larson. They played in three Super Bowls in four years. Probably, I think, the most gut-wrenching uh, of all the lion losses happened on this day in September of 74. With the Lions trailing 7-6, to six, time running out, they moved the ball to the Minnesota 12-yard line. The plan was simple. 
run down the clock, call timeout, send Earl Mann, their really pretty good place kicker, onto the field to kick a field goal and win the game. And so the Lions did that. They ran the ball down there. They ran the clock down to almost zero seconds. The Vikings were ahead seven to six. They called timeout. And as the camera panned to the Detroit sideline, Joe Smith was the head coach in those days. You could see the the coaches kind of giving five to each other and smiling like, hey, we finally got these guys and we're going to beat them. So out trots the field goal team. And uh, the ball is snapped. The kick is away. But at that moment, all pro defensive end Carl Eller breaks through the line of the off Lions and he blocked the field goal attempt. And the Lions lose again. So, I, and I just remember, I'll never forget that. I used to, can you believe it? So close, so far. Jesus said to this scribe he was talking to, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Not far from the kingdom of God. It seems that um, this is the story uh, of, a, of a young couple that has been in love for a few years, and they plan to get married, but somehow the marriage doesn't happen. Uh, you're not far from the kingdom of God. This is the story of uh, business partners who just are ready to make a great move in business, and uh, somehow everything falls apart so close and, uh, and yet so far. It's what our scripture is today. Now, as we have read the scripture lesson, we see Jesus interacting with yet another teacher of the law about the greatest commandment. And to our surprise, for one of the rare times in the New Testament, as we look at the life of Jesus, there is complete agreement between Jesus and the man who was asking him what the first commandment was. And then the final word is, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I have a couple of things I want to do this morning as we explore uh, kind of the meaning of the phrase and the implications that it has for us, I think, as a community of faith and our mission in New Era and throughout the world. Verse 12, verse 32, well, teacher, the man replied, you're right in saying that God is one, there is no one other but him, to love him with all your heart and soul and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered him wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Now, the context of today's passage is right near the end of Jesus' ministry. In fact, if you're familiar with Holy Week that starts on what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, And then on Friday, we have the death of Jesus and Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. It is between Sunday and Thursday that this particular occasion occurs where Jesus answers this question and he talks with this teacher of the law. Happens sometime between Sunday and Thursday or maybe on Thursday even. But on this particular day, all of Jerusalem was buzzing about Jesus. He was the newsmaker whose entry into Jerusalem had stirred the city and raised the hopes of the nation that the Messiah had come and was going to bring the kingdom of God. In today's parlance, Jesus would be surrounded by reporters and cameras and microphones. People walking by would stop in their tracks, get their cell phones out, and they'd record a video of what was going on. Folks were so excited and um, just incredible occasion. In fact, it caused, Jesus was so popular, it caused his enemies, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, it's, they said this in chapter 12, uh, 19, uh, they say, look, the whole world has gone after him. The same thing is recorded in John. Uh, they look, look, the world has gone after him. Now, as we consider a little more, the context, Jesus had recently done something that was shocking in the city of Jerusalem after the triumphal entry. Mark eleven fifteen 15 says this. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables and money changers and the benches of those selling doves. 
and he would not allow anyone to carry any merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. Now this was probably the final straw between Jesus and the religious establishment. You see, for Jesus, the purpose of the temple was to help facilitate people's relationship with God, where they could enter God's presence and they could know God. However, what the religious establishment had done, it was really to put up barriers for people as they sought to experience God and to worship God. These barriers had become really corrupt obstacles where people had to purchase sacrifices and pay exorbitant fees for them. It really made things difficult for people to come to God and worship at the temple. The temple had become a money-making scheme for some folks. Probably happens today too, doesn't it? Mark tells us in chapter eleven eighteen 18, that when the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, when they heard it, they began to look for ways to kill him because they feared him, because the people were amazed at his teaching. And so they start asking Jesus questions. It's really an inquisition. They want to challenge his beliefs, his politics, his theology, and his practice. They try to get him to do something, to say something that gives them justification for putting him to death, for killing him. And so these people have come, one after the other, arguing, accusing, questioning. But calmly and deliberately, Jesus has answered every question beautifully. And so they came, one after another, accusing him, uh, the text says. Finally, after all of this, we come to chapter 12, verses 38 through 34, which our text is today, and we find at least one person of sincerity who's got the courage to come for, forward and ask Jesus an honest and sincere question. Now he says, this guy too is a teacher of the law, the scripture says, but he respects Jesus. Now, as a teacher of the law, it would make perfect sense for him to want, as he loved God, to want to keep the commandments perfectly. Now, get a load of this. Um, and I went to a website and I read them this week. Um, for this guy to keep God's commandments, there were 613 of them that the Pharisees and the scribes had conjured up. 613. Um, I, don't, I read them. I wouldn't have a prayer. Okay, I'd have been a bad Jew, all right, in, in those days. I could, I, it's just unbelievable. You got to Google that and, and look them up. And so he cuts through all the red tape, this teacher of the law. He cut, cuts through all the red tape. And he says, Jesus, he, he, I think this guy has a sense. He has a sense this is craziness. This is insanity. Trying to please God with 613 different things. I mean, who would have time for a job with this kind of craziness? And so he says to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him with a summary of the Ten Commandments. The first Ten Commandments deal with our relation. First four, rather, deal with our relationship with God. The, the final six commandments deal with our relationships with other people. And Jesus summarizes this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, Jesus understood, even talking about the Ten Commandments, following, G following the Lord is simply summed up by two things, and it's not complicated to love God with everything that we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves. He said in Matthew 22, 40, on these two commandments, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, walking with Jesus finally and totally is walking with an ethic, with a lifestyle, with our behavior, walking to the tune of wanting to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so people were attracted to Jesus. So this is why the teacher of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, 
opposed Jesus. As far as they were concerned, it was about 613 rules and regulations. Not only were the regulations out of control, but they allowed for people to turn faith into something external. That following God isn't really about a transformation of one's heart and inward disposition to turn from sin to God, but following God is really just about obeying these external rigid rules, and, uh, and that really wasn't serving anybody or serving God well, for sure. So it's all about rules and rituals. In Matthew 23, 27, Jesus says this about these people. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, he says, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and every unclean thing. And he has another warning for the teachers of the law. He says, uh, he taught, he says, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace and, and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus said. So once again, the Pharisees, the law, the regulations of the temple, we're blocking people's access from God, making it hard for people to understand God, to really know God, and to follow His way. Now, we should pause here and realize that following Jesus is about loving God and loving neighbor. We should also pause here and contemplate, as has been sung about and noted already this morning, something beautiful in this moment about Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. You see, there is that infinite gap between us and God. And God cannot wink at our sin. It must be atoned for. It must be paid for. It must be, it must be washed away. And so God put Jesus to death. He made him sin to be knew no sin, so that in him, as we come by faith to Jesus, can uh, have a relationship with God. And this is, this is a beautiful thing. You know, there's not one thing that I can do or you can do to make God love me more than what he already does. Think about that. There's not one thing that I can do to make God love me less than what he all, already does through Jesus Christ. All God wants of us is he gives us the gift of faith as a conduit that we might receive the grace of God. You see, the Bible says, again, he was put to death for our sins, raised for our justification. Man, if you, if you are confused by this, I want to talk to you after this service. Talk to me or one of our elders at the church. This is just the most fundamental, important, crucial thing that we understand. That following Jesus is not about rules. It's about a heart filled with love that pushes us on toward holiness and wanting to be God's people. Now, something for us to consider. We need to consider the fact that New Era Reformed Church, we are now part of the religious establishment. Okay? We're not the folks on the outside that are trying to come to God. We are the folks on the inside who've been called to mission to make it easy for people to come to Christ and to follow Him. Mark 2.15, I mean, Jesus' focus of his life and his work was incredibly outward, outwardly looking. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with people, these sinners at Matthew's house, they, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus told them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I have come not to call the righteous, uh, but the sinners. And, and by the way, he's saying to those Pharisees, he says, when I say I'm coming to call, uh, I'm coming to minister to the sick, I'm counting you among the sick because your self-righteousness that has calloused you, your self-righteousness is, is not capable of earning a relationship with God. In fact, your self-righteousness will take you further from God that, than you have been. You see, and their understand, the Pharisees, their understanding of the law kept people away from God. If Jesus were uh, pure according to their understanding of God, Jesus would not accept sinners into his presence. He'd be pushing them away because the view was, if I know sinful people or uh, have dinner with them or even 
Lord forbid, invite them to worship, I might be contaminated by them. Okay, see, we don't have a faith. We don't follow a Lord that lived his life in retreat. We don't have a Lord who was fearful that he would be contaminated by the world, but rather our Lord went forward bravely and boldly with this good news, believing that the gospel of Christ would cover the world with God's love. Christians don't live and do ministry in retreat. We share the love of God freely and boldly in the name of Jesus. Now, I think uh, in light of this, you know, it's all about the mission of God, people, Old Testament, New Testament. I think there's three things to consider as we become a community of faith and we want to help people come to God through Jesus Christ. I think the first thing a community needs to be known for is to, is to lead with love, to lead with love. People need truth. They need truth. And what we have to offer to the world is truth and love. It's a perfect match. It should work. But if you want to keep people from God, lead with the truth only. Lead with the truth only. It prevents people from having a relationship. It just just gives a feeling of condemnation and shame. And and people need the truth. They don't want to hear it from a jerk. They want to hear it from someone who is filled with the love of God touching them. Pastor Vince Antonachis, he converted to Christ after being raised in a home that did not worship God or know him. And because of his background, uh, growing up being a foreigner to the ways and the things of God, I mean, he has been passionate in his pastoral ministry about helping people know Jesus. He tells a story about, I'm reading about a guy named Ted And Ted used to be the head sound man for the Grateful Dead. Wow, can you imagine that? I don't know if we have any deadheads here or not this morning. I guess we we can talk about that later. That was kind of funny, actually. All right. So this is what he says. He said, Ted had never gone to church, had no interest in God. His sister, a Christian who lives in a different state, begged him to check out our church. One day he finally showed up. Eventually, he volunteered to help run the sound. One Sunday at our pre-service meeting, he announced to everyone that he didn't believe anything that our church taught. I asked him, well, why do you continue to attend? He choked up and said, I've never felt love like this before. Wow, I've never felt love like this before. He continued coming to our church, and four months later, he accepted the truth about Jesus and she said, and he said, as I write this today, it's been 10 months after Ted first showed up, and he's currently overseas on a mission trip where he is loving people now because of Jesus, hoping they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Lead with love. Lead with love. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Lead with love, Jesus calls us to do. The second thing I think about that's important for the community of faith, the church to understand is we need to let people believe before we expect them to behave. We need to let people believe the gospel before we we can't expect non-Christians to behave like Christians, can we? Why would we? Because they don't have faith in Jesus and the power to live for Jesus comes from Jesus. And so we need to have uh, patience and understanding. You know, um, in our recovery ministry at Evergreen, we had all kinds of characters uh, come, and it was just a beautiful community to be a part of. People that you want in church, okay? In fact, they were coming on Sunday nights when all the Christians decided they wouldn't go to church on Sunday night anymore. So tell these drunks and drug addicts all about that. There was a gal named Holly, and she said she always believed there must be a God She wanted to know him, but she tried several churches and never went back to any one of them a second time. She said, all I ever heard from people was that I was doing the wrong things and I was looking the wrong way. Every church told her what she should and shouldn't be doing. Several churches asked her to dress more appropriately on her next visit. Of course, there never was a next visit, as she always felt judged. Then one day, she showed up at a recovery ministry our worship service, our 12-step meeting. And yes, she was dressed inappropriately. But we chose to ignore that 
because we were used to people coming broken, right? And looking like that. And we felt that our role was to point her to Jesus, not to point out what was wrong with her life. If she was ever going to change, the Holy Spirit would have to do the work. Holly thanked people in our ministry after coming to Christ for being real and accepting her. She came back a second time. In fact, she kept coming until she came to faith. And then everything changed about her life. She dressed differently. She broke up with an abusive boyfriend. She actually began helping and serving in the ministry. Why did she start behaving? She behaved because now she believed and had God prompting her heart through the Holy Spirit to make these changes out of joy and not because of the law or not because I have to measure up to these things before I come to faith. And so I think it's important for a church understanding as it reaches out to the community that we have to be patient with people. They come among us and want to worship with us and hopefully join on with us and walk with us in the family of God that we were looking for them, love them into the kingdom and, and to believing. And then the third thing, I think it's really important for the church to understand is that we need to base our outreach and our focus on the community more on our shared brokenness than our holiness. More on our brokenness than how we've got our act together. You see, every community of people who make up the church hold belief in common, probably certain expectations about um, how we're going to behave towards each other. We love one another. The New Testament teaches us you know, how to do that. But as um, we live our lives, uh, the church so often, not our church, I'm saying, but I think the American church in general, one of the reasons that is, fall, that is disliked and loathed is because we've come across as so self-righteous. We're better than you. Uh, we know more than you. And if you would just do what we do, you'd be okay. That is a turnoff to people. I don't know about you. I'm a Christian because I'm a broken sinner. And I needed the grace of God in my life. And that's how I think God calls me, calls you to interact with people that come across our way. It's, we, it's one beggar has been said, one beggar sharing bread with another beggar and, uh, and, and where to find it. And so it's just really, I think, important community needs to be made, uh, based more on shared broken and sinfulness than on holiness. Then I want to, this morning, break down this phrase. You are near the kingdom of God. You've come close. And then it says no one asked him any more, dared to ask him any more questions. Well, God, I've got questions. I've got questions for you on this passage. You see, the scribes were masters of the dutiful art of spiritual discipline. They noted these 613 commandments. They scrupulously, I guess I'd be cranky too if I was trying to obey 613 commandments all the time. So we've got to cut those guys some slack. He avoided, uh, they, they wouldn't even say God's name out loud for fear of assault, uh, insulting God. They saw to a circumcision decision. Happened to every child. And so finally, this teacher of the law comes to Jesus without hidden motivation. Uh, he has this heartfelt sincerity the Lord can, can check. This guy's, this guy's been impressed with the answers of Jesus. I think he gets it. He, um, he's aware of what his own colleagues have been trying to do, but he loves God. He loves the law. The Spirit's working in his life. He senses that something's missing. 613 aren't doing it for him. There's an incompleteness here to his life. And he asks Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Maybe that'll do the trick for him. So Jesus recites the Shema, saying the Lord our God is one. Okay? He's one. He's holy. He's one. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, everything depends on that. Now, as Jesus is sharing this man, it's more than just a word exchange. Jesus is making a connection here. He is the seeker. This man is a seeker of God who genuinely wants to please God. And the scribe is so excited by what he hears 
Jesus has struck a chord in his heart. His soul resonates with Jesus. And he says, well, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, all your understanding and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. He's starting to awaken to the beautiful truth of God and what it means to follow God. He adds nothing. But then he adds, he does add to the end his un developing understanding, doing these things, loving God and loving others is more important than all the sacrifices that, that, we, that we do and, and things that we try to behave with. He says, he adds that. And then Jesus says, amen? And both of them realized there was something between them. Looking at him, Jesus said, well, you're a good guy. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Not far. You see, Jesus is moved by this man's earnestness. He looks the scribe in the face. He says, you're not far from the kingdom. After that, Mark knows no one dared to ask him any more questions. Now, as I said earlier, excuse me, I, my questions are beginning this, with this man. Uh, this man has gotten him, what has gotten this man so close to the kingdom, and yet Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. What is it about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength that gets you almost all the way home almost to heaven. You're not far from the kingdom. What is it gets him close, but yet remaining outside the kingdom? Well, I think the answer is, is similar to Luke's story. The rich young ruler asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, it's no mystery. He says, go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Come and follow me. The man went away sad because he had many possessions. The story is similar to John's story, I think, of Nicodemus visiting Jesus at night. And Jesus said, you are a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand what I tell you when I say you must be, must be born again. You see, in the encounter with this man who's near the kingdom, Jesus is not only offering his interpretation of Scripture, and how to joyfully follow God, but even more, Jesus is offering himself to this seeker. You are not far from the kingdom. It's two feet away from you. Come, he's saying, and follow me. Jesus shows the power of the kingdom resides in himself. Jesus has demonstrated in his miracles, and in his life that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In Luke 11, Jesus says, if it is by the finger of God that I, I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In Mark 2, he eats with sinners. In Mark 4, he calms the storm, saying, quiet, be still. His disciples were terrified. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? In Mark 5, he heals a demoniac full of demons, and he raises a little girl from the dead. You see, all of these miracles and many others point to the fact that the kingdom of God is present in Jesus Christ. And we enter that kingdom through a relationship with him. You are not far from the kingdom. Right, He's right there. I'm just very near you. He's saying you must receive me. You must walk with me. I must be your Lord and Savior. You must follow me and be my disciple. You see, Jesus is the kingdom. Where the king is, there is the kingdom. This is precisely why Jesus says to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Wow. Our first cause is to proclaim the wonderful message of Jesus and then proclaim that Jesus is king. Invite folks into the healing, into the hope, and the love of the kingdom of God as they become part of our church community following Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. And so I want to ask, where are you today? Um, are you near the kingdom? Are you in the kingdom? Are, is Christ your Lord and your Savior? Are you willing to follow him? Man, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Um, if you're not there, if you're here asking questions, that's okay. Okay, it's all right to ask questions, to explore. And, um, say, my faith isn't full yet, but I'm open. Well, keep being open. 
Keep coming back. Hopefully we'll love you. Hopefully we'll love you and help you come to Jesus. Wow. Paul wrote, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do not, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and one day every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We thank you for the privilege of following him. We pray that you will forgive us where our following has been inconsistent and weak. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will just revive us and renew us to be your people. We pray that the loving arms of God would be extended through this community of faith, New Era Reformed Church, to a community that needs Jesus. And we will praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You would stand and join us. Maybe now is that chance to declare once again um, that we're going to give our heart to the Lord. Let's see.
The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Have a great day, everyone.